In the office of Paul's editor, we see cover art for several Misery books. This is the book series that made him famous and caused his self-proclaimed number one fan to keep him prisoner after he breaks his legs. This one is a French version of Misery's Love, one of the four Misery books specifically mentioned in the novel by Stephen King. Misery's Quest is another, and we can see that cover right here. The first Misery book is called The Adventures of Misery Chastain in the movie. It's a little easier to see later on in the film. We also get a look at the cover of the original finale of the Misery series, Misery's Child. Annie would force Paul to write a sequel to Misery's Child, which would be known as Misery's Return, and in the pages we see him writing, there's some easter eggs you might have missed. Stick around to the end of this video to hear about them. Welcome to Things You Missed, today I'm covering the 1990 film adaptation of Stephen King's novel, Misery. If you haven't figured that out already. That's what we're doing today. King was not really all that down to sell the movie rights to Misery at first, which I do find kind of ironic because the main character kind of considers himself a sellout. But according to Mental Floss, he ended up changing his mind because he liked what director Rob Reiner did in adapting his novella, The Body, into the movie known as Stand By Me, which is a non-horror movie, so I probably won't cover it on my channel, but there is one scene that is truly horrifying. Anyway, let's get back to misery. <laughs> The movie opens with Paul finishing up his next novel. He's finally free of making misery books after killing the character in the previous one, so he's moved on to something more serious. We can see some of the text on the final page of this book. It reads, I better not take that for granted anymore, he told himself. Breathing might not seem like much, but without it, what else was there? This is Paul not practicing what he preaches, not yet at least, because at the end of the movie, he'll eventually admit that he was taking his life for granted before his experience with Annie Wilkes. <sighs> some way, Wilkes, I don't experience, uh, help me. Annie tries to make him burn his book later on, and in doing so, we get a glimpse of the first page. But it actually looks more like an essay about teen movies, and mentions Say Anything, Risky Business, The Graduate, and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. After finishing this new book, Paul leaves the hotel he was writing it at, and his car has a VKY722 license plate, which is a common plate seen in a lot of movies like The Freshman, Shaft, and The Wolf of Wall Street. There are probably others, I guess this is like the Wilhelm scream of license plates. Just before heading off, he throws a snowball at a tree, which may be a small nod to the fact that he played high school baseball in the novel, where he supposedly couldn't hit a curve. And I wouldn't be emo Abraham Lincoln if I didn't mention this part. I was a writer then. You're still a writer. I've been a writer since I got in the misery business. Earlier I mentioned that we get to see the cover of Misery's Child in the film, and when we see it, you'll also notice that the publisher is Viking Press, who in real life at the time published several Stephen King novels such as The Dead Zone, Firestarter, Cujo, Christine, The Talisman, The Eyes of the Dragon, It, and of course, Misery. When Paul wakes up in Annie's house after the crash, she tells him where he is. We're just outside Silver Creek. This has changed from the fictional town of Sidewinder, Colorado in the book. Silver Creek is a real town, in fact it was a former mining town, which could be a clue about the old miners' practice of hobbling their workers, a tactic that Annie later uses on her prisoner. There are also references to mining in some of the newspapers seen on screen. Usually in Things You Missed, whenever there are newspapers, there are easter eggs, mainly consisting of the art departments of the movie trying to sneak their names in there as the author of an article or something. There's not a whole lot of that in Misery though, and I think it's because many of the articles are just copied from real real-life local newspapers in Nye County, Nevada, where the movie was filmed. It actually shows up a couple of times if you pay close attention, even though the setting of the movie is supposed to be Clear Creek County in Colorado. The only crew reference easter egg found in the many newspapers that appear in Misery is the article about Annie being arrested after the death of several babies in her maternity ward, where it states that her lawyer is named Stephen Popelka, who is likely a relative of Joseph Popelka, a production assistant. Outside of the newspapers, there's also a sticky note in the police chief's office that says Call Carlson, a reference to Charles Carlson, the prop master slash set dresser. And that's it. So let's go back to Annie's house because it's breakfast time. I made you my specialty. 
Scrambled eggs a la Wilkes. How is scrambled eggs your specialty? I mean, I'm instantly reminded of this one line in the book where Paul is critical of her cooking. Everything she cooked came out tasting strangely industrial, as if years of eating in hospital cafeterias had somehow corrupted any culinary talent she might have once had. Not long after, she has her first explosive episode, after reading about Misery's death at the end of the final book. She leaves to go away to her laughing place, but before going, tells Paul, You better hope nothing happens to me. Because if I die, you die. I feel like I've heard that somewhere before. I think you missed the part. That if he dies, you die. Not quite, but pretty close. Paul sneaks out of the room and nearly breaks a ceramic penguin, which is actually more of a recurring symbol in the book, where Annie uses it as an example, saying that she knows that Paul's been out of the room. The cops take a look at it while inspecting the house in the summer, and near the very end, he actually throws it through the parlor window to get their attention. He also discovers a shrine dedicated to none other than himself, where Annie has a signed photo in each of the nine misery books with two copies of the first eight. As someone who owns certain movies on both DVD and Blu-ray and probably will get 4Ks in the future, I can kind of relate. He also snoops around in the kitchen, where if you're paying attention you may see another connection to the book, in the form of this calendar that's still stuck on February, because Annie keeps forgetting to turn the pages. In the novel, it's in the guest room that Paul's staying at, where it serves as a byproduct of her deteriorating mental state, but I guess it's in the kitchen for the film. One of the reasons Paul snuck out of the room was to get more medication, and he has a plan for what he wants to do with it. He empties the capsules into a small pocket, he folds using a piece of notebook paper, and tries to poison Annie with it at dinner. In the scene where he's emptying out the capsules, we see this strange camera angle, and I think this is Annie's point of view. There's a part in the book where she looks into the room through a keyhole, and that's what I think is going on here, and maybe the reason she knocks over the glass of wine in the dinner scene is actually no accident. After refilling the glass, they toast to the return of the Misery character, and in the days that follow, Paul gets down to work writing the novel. If you look at the pages on the typewriter, many of them are actually accurate to the text in the book. To be perfectly clear, Misery by Stephen King has certain chapters that are just excerpts from Misery's Return by Paul Sheldon, and the text in the typewriter is often word for word. There are a couple of deviations, like this part, which corresponds to page 169, but with an added paragraph to account for the name change in the movie, where Jeffrey is now known as Windthorn. I don't know the reason for the change, though. Then there's this shot, where the top paragraph is pulled from page 168, but the bottom paragraph is new text, which says, as the flames crept ever higher, Misery realized that only she stood between something. I wonder if this was added as a foreshadowing of the end of the movie, where Misery is actually in flames, literally, because Paul burns the book, whereas in the novel he hides the real Misery's return and burns a blank stack of pages to hit Annie where it hurts most. <laughs> But as Paul progresses with the book, Annie realizes that her time with Paul can't last forever and falls into a depressive episode. That night, we see an exterior of the house during a thunderstorm. The camera is crooked. This is called a Dutch angle, and in this case it's used to signal that Annie is off balance mentally. You're a beautiful, brilliant, famous man of the world, and I'm not a movie star type. Says Kathy Bates, the woman who would win an Oscar for this role. Kathy Bates in Misery. I would like to thank Jimmy Kahn and apologize publicly for the ankles. <laughs> Annie decides to go away again and Paul sneaks out of the room again, where he finds Annie's scrapbook. And while these newspaper articles documenting her real life aren't as reference heavy as I'd hoped, there is still info we can pull from them. Like for example, if the movie feels like it covers a shorter time span than the book, it's because it does. The article claims that Paul's vehicle was found after one week, and this is not long before the end of the movie at this point. So the whole time that he was at Annie's in the movie really only seems to cover a few weeks, maybe a month, whereas in the novel he's in captivity for five months. This is one of the many examples of the movie just being so much more tame and toned down. One movie change that I did like, which really makes Annie that much scarier as an antagonist is this detail. It says she was a valedictorian in high school and graduated nursing school as a magna cum laude, meaning her grade point average was almost perfect. So in addition to being this big, forceful person, she's also very clever. And with two broken legs, Paul's only real hope is to outsmart her in order to escape his situation. As you know if you watch my channel, I love a good psychological battle in a horror movie. Another movie difference is that we actually
actually see the police chief trying to find him, rather than just seeing everything from Paul's perspective. And he even has a little desk cowboy dressed exactly like him. I wish I had a little desk cowboy version of me. At some point, the Colorado State Police get involved in searching for Paul, and Buster ends up on the helicopter to see if he can spot anything out of the ordinary. Now, Misery is a very Hitchcockian horror film. In particular, it's very similar to Alfred Hitchcock's 1954 film Rear Window, where the main character is also confined to a single room after breaking his leg. Hitchcock was known for almost always making a cameo appearance in his movies, so Misery director Rob Reiner decided to do the same, though he is very hard to identify in his appearance as the helicopter pilot. Hitchcock would not be the only legendary director that Reiner took inspiration from. There was also a lot of influence from Stanley Kubrick. At the end of Misery, we see Paul again, 18 months later, and he's finished a new novel called The Higher Education of J. Philip Stone. Gotta wonder if this has anything to do with Philip Stone, an actor who often worked with Kubrick and appeared in Barry Lyndon, A Clockwork Orange, and perhaps most notably The Shining. He's the guy who tells Jack to correct them. But I corrected them, sir. If that one seems like a stretch, keep in mind that at the time, there were only two Stephen King novels that took place in his fictional town of Sidewinder, Colorado, and those two were Misery and The Shining. Let's move on to the finale. Remember how for all those years nobody knew who Misery's real father was? Or if they'd ever be reunited? It's all right here. This is an actual plot point in Misery's Return, the book within the Stephen King book, but it happens much earlier, at the start of what I assume is basically the second act, not at the end, like how the movie Paul writes it out. Eventually, Paul finished her off when he knocks her out with a pig ornament, and this is symbolic because the pig represents Misery, and he has an actual pig of her own named Misery, which Paul doesn't like because he thought he was done writing the Misery novels, so he ends up using Misery against her to finally do away with his captor. There's an interesting scene at the end where Annie reappears 18 months later while Paul is at lunch with his editor, but it turns out to just be his imagination because of the PTSD he acquired while staying with her. This is meant to be kind of similar to the book, where we're given the impression that Annie survived and ambushed him at his apartment, but it just turns out to be a writer's scenario. It's not really clear if he imagined it just because of the PTSD, or if he was just letting his mind wander and write out a worst case scenario type of scene. That part in the movie does a good job of recreating that dynamic, because when Paul sees her, he doesn't panic. It just takes him a moment to concentrate and convince himself that it's not really Annie, because he knows that she's dead. Also, the name of the woman who played the waitress is Wendy Bowers. How great is that? It's like Wendy Torrance meets Henry Bowers. And she claims to be his number one fan. As the credits roll, we hear the Liberace song, I'll Be Seeing You. You may remember that Liberace was Annie's favorite musician. Annie Wilkes is the embodiment of the toxic fan, which has become an even bigger topic of discussion in the years since Misery's release. So join me in the next episode of Horror History, where I'll be analyzing the entire history of Annie Wilkes. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring that death bell, for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one, assuming we stay inside.